For today's review, I'd like to take a look at uh, this book. This is the Tyndall House Greek New Testament. Uh, it's a crossway publication, and it comes in a slipcase, which is what you're looking at now. And the book itself is actually inside. And this is the, uh, the back of it that provides information. Some of the key points are, it says a 10-point type. We'll take a look at that and compare it to symbol. Single column paragraph format. It has a ribbon marker. It has a limited, not what you would see in the UBS-5 or the NA-28, but it does have a textual apparatus. It is Smythe sewn, and it comes with a guarantee. And here are the ISBNs, the 13 and the 10 for the book. You see the price there is 40 US dollars, but I think you can get it from uh, Christian book distributors for about 20. I believe that's what I paid for this. So let's pull it out and take a look at it. It is, as we said, it's a black hardback. Comes in a slip case. Uh, it's also available in brown cowhide and in French Morocco. It's a very nice book, so it might be worth thinking about getting. It comes with a symbol on the cover, which you might recognize. It's a combination of a, a towel, which looks like a Latin T, and a row which looks like a P, the P a little bit higher over the top of the T. This is called a storogram. Uh, it's also on the spine, and the storogram is used to abbreviate the uh, Greek word storos, storos, which is a word for the cross. Book is eight and one sixteenth inches tall, five and a half inches wide, and one and three eighths inches thick and once you've broken it in it lies fa fairly flat when you have it open so you can open it not to Genesis but to Matthew and have it lie flat and I think we should be able to show that there's very little sheen the paper is very diffuse in terms of reflectivity any sheen you're seeing is probably off the ink it's very nice that way as well. So we'll take a look. It's a normal hardback. I think this is a vinyl bonded somehow to paper on the inside. And you have the title page. Title page produced at Tyndall House, Cambridge. And it mentions Crossway. So we'll look here at the copyright page. Published by Crossway and Cambridge University Press title, copyright date, uh, tell you where to direct your permission requests, hardcover and true tone ISBNs. Let's just check re rapidly to see if that's the correct hardcover. That is the correct hardcover ISBN. I've never seen a true tone. And here you have the information on the version editions. So this is the first edition in 2017. And it mentions L-E-G-O here. So this is a, a book that's not printed and bound by Youngblood in the Netherlands. It's printed and bound by L-E-G-O in Italy. That's uh, Legatoria Editora Editoriale Giovanni Olivato, I think. Um, here is the uh, table of contents. And uh, you should be able to notice that the books are not in their normal order. You have, as usual, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the Acts. And then the next book is James, followed by First and Second Peter, First, Second, and Third John, um, and Jude, Romans. So you go into the Pauline epistles, then they all seem to be in the right order, and then Hebrews and the Apocalypse. When we look at the introduction, which is at the back of the book, I will, uh, I will show you the paragraph where they explain why they've done and what they've done. The uh, page thickness is about 89 microns, so my guess that the paper weight is 81 GSM, and although you can see lines through there, it really is not troublesome when you uh, try to read the book. Um, 
I think it's the, the print is fairly dark. It's not as bold as it could be, but it's fairly dark, so it really doesn't cause an issue. This is much heavier paper than you would find in the uh, Nestle Elan 28th edition or the United Bible Society's 5th edition, which I will be referring to as the NA28 and the UBS5. Um, there are no breaks in the text. There's a short preface here. There's no breaks in the text for headings, no headings at all. And we'll look at the page layout more closely in a minute when I get the book up on the stand. Um, you can demonstrate to yourself that it is sewn. Here, here's some stitching lines. You should be able to see them in there. So it is definitely a sewn book. And as I mentioned, the end of the New Testament, which happens on page 504, we have the introduction. It's kind of backwards to our normal way of doing things. So we'll take a look at that in a minute. And there are acknowledgments. A couple of blank pages, three, and we're at the back. And here's the ribbon marker, which I may not have mentioned. It is a 8 millimeter, 3 eighths of an inch ribbon marker, I believe. So I've backed up to the introduction just to show you some of the highlights. Um, they say, the editors say that they want to present the New Testament in an easily readable format, and I think they've succeeded there. It does seem to be easily readable. Um, they mentioned that this is revision of an edition made in the 19th century by Samuel P. Tregellis, whose name might be well known to some of you. Um, I've seen on the on YouTube um, videos by one of the editors, uh, Dirk Youngkin. I might be mispronouncing his last name, but I believe his name is Youngkin, uh, in which he points out that one of the reasons they chose Tregellis as the starting point is that unlike so many of the 19th century textual critics, he was actually a believer. Um, <clears throat> they mention on the next page that although they started with Trigellus, um, their revision has been more thoroughgoing than they had anticipated. Um, what they've done here is they have um, insisted that the text be uh, witnessed by two or more Greek manuscripts, at least one being from the 5th century or earlier. So their goal here is to present you something that's based on extant ancient manuscripts. I think there is some point in the uh, introduction where they, they mentioned that they recognized that ancient readings might be preserved in older manuscripts, but their goal here is simply to look at the older manuscripts and reproduce that information here. <clears throat> I think they say that perhaps here somewhere on page 507. Um, we acknowledge that at times a late manuscript may contain a text that is logically prior to and ancestral to that in the extant early manuscripts. Uh -huh. There is a section here on orthography, which doesn't interest me, so we'll flip past this. This mostly has to do with the spellings that they've chosen, and they seem to be want to be guided by the spellings that are actually in the older editions. Uh, one thing they do notice here is they haven't uh, tried to re reproduce the nomina sacra, so they spell out words like God and Jesus and Lord and Christ, and not just put the initial and the final letters with a line over them, which was common in the uh, ancient times. In fact, that's what the Storos on the cover was um, used as. It was used as a shorthand for a cross in the Greek manuscripts. <clears throat> um, here is where they talk about the order of the books. Um, they say the order that we presented reflects the strong tendency to place Catholic epistles immediately after Acts, and then they do say that they're 
is justification for placing Hebrews between the Second Thessalonians and one Timothy, First Timothy, but they have not done that. Um, here also on five twelve, they mention that paragraphs are um, what they found in the actual manuscripts. They're not doing it uh, using their own logic and what makes sense in terms of ordering organizing the material. They're using what was actually in the manuscripts. And the paragraphs are marked not by indentation, by, by, but by ekthesis, where one draws out the first line. And we'll see that more clearly when we put the book uh, under our examination, look at it more closely. Um, go forward a few more pages. And they have a few words here about the apparatus, which is quite limited. It's nothing like what you would see, I think I've mentioned in, in the uh, Deutsche Bibelgesellschaft editions. Um, but they've chosen to list three types of variants. Those that are close contenders, which they mark by a diamond. Those that have high exegetical importance. And ones that illustrate scribal habits. Uh, Youngkin, I believe, did his dissertation on the scribal habits of the various scribes who um, wrote and corrected Sinaiticus. <clears throat> um, the apparatus um, <clears throat> here, they say that the apparatus, um, what am I looking for? Um, it's limited, merely provides some of the evidence for the decision. Further evidence will be provided in a planned textual commentary, which is not yet out. Uh, however, I did notice when I was um, researching the book for this video that the Tyndall House does have a blog where certain of their decisions are being discussed beforehand. But this commentary should be very interesting for reasons that you will see in just a few minutes when we start looking at differences between this text and UBS 5. Um, and then they give you an extensive and very detailed bit of information on the uh, different different um, witnesses that attest to the different readings that they use in the apparatus. This is more than what you'll see in the UBS 5. Um, it's not as much information as, a, as is available online. In fact, they give us a website here that we can go to and find much more extensive information about the different manuscripts. All right, so now let's take a closer look at the pages themselves, their design. Um, the dimensions are uh, 197 millimeters top to bottom and 132 millimeters wide. Um, there are verse references out in the uh, margin, but those are for the paragraph the paragraphs which are starting here, it's indicated by ekthesis. So the first line in the paragraph is offset a bit to the left. It's about three millimeters. The, uh, unlike the Trinitarian Bible Society Greek New Testament, which also has verse references, uh, verse numbers in the co side column, this edition has them within the text. So you can see verse 39 there, verse 40 is beginning there. The uh, book names, according to John here, are at the top center of the page. The first full verse on the pages that are lying open is indicated on the outside left, and the last full verse on this right-hand side page is indicated in the outside column. Page numbers are in the inside. Um, there are as many as 36 lines of text. You get the 36 lines when you do not have a textual apparatus at the bottom of the page, as we do have one here. Um, text column is a bit under 97 millimeters wide uh, with that thesis, and about 94 millimeters wide without it. So 97 here and 94 there. I count um, about 62 characters on a tightly packed line, um, but I've also counted as many as 64. The, uh, the font size, let us switch pages rapidly so that we can show that to you. Let's 
see is the uh, font size and the text. Look at this. Uh, the capital letters are very close to nine point symbol. And to my eye, the lowercase letters match up nicely at nine points as well. So although it's advertised as 10 point, and doubtless it is a 10 point in whatever font this is, the size is comparable to a 9 point in symbol font. I also did uh, the calculation in the BICA system, where one simply measures the height of a column, divides by the number of lines to get the uh, dimensions on the page that each line occupies and then divide by 0 0.3514 which is a point in the PICA system and I get 13 so this font could well be advertised as a 13 point font the reason I think it's so large is look at all the white space between the lines the, uh, the leading is very very good in this the font in the notes down here in the apparatus is about a 7.5 point symbol equivalent. Also I like the tracking. The letters are not too close to each other. Seems like it's uh, very nicely done, very well designed. And as I've said earlier, I like the way that they're fairly bold. Talk about margins next. Um, let's look over here because the margin here on the title page is going to be radically different. Oh, by the way, books of the New Testament do seem always to start on their own pages. At the top, from the top of this line of text, upwards, is about 17 millimeters. At the bottom it varies. Here it's quite large, but I've seen it as small as 12. That depends on how much of this kind of material they have to try to pack on the page. Uh, the outside from here is about 18 to the side and uh, on the inside it can be as much as 20 20 millimeters so we will um, stop the video here and then we'll talk about some interesting readings what makes this Greek New Testament different from the others in this section of the video I'd like to take a look at some of the differences between the Tyndall House and the UBS 5 Greek New Testaments. Now they're, they're both made on similar principles. They both weigh heavily the evidence from the ancient manuscripts that were preserved in the dry atmosphere of the Egyptian desert. Um, so they're, they're based on similar principles, but they're made by different groups of people at different times. And uh, the criteria by which they select their readings is uh, not all agreed to by everyone, not interpreted or applied in the same way, so it's somewhat subjective. Um, as I mentioned in other videos, uh, as far as I can tell, textual criticism should not be called a science because there's no way to reproduce results. Um, <clears throat> one can't test and make sure that you've got the right answer. We don't have the originals anymore. So these are, these are rational guesses, kind of like detective work before all the evidence comes in. Sometimes you have the wrong suspect. Um, in uh, the Air Force, uh, when you have people who are trying to make a decision this way, um, it's called the BOGSAT method. A bunch of guys sitting around a table. Uh, the G could also be gals, but it's, a, it's a sort of a subjective decision-making approach. Um, what I've done here is, uh, you should be seeing a slide soon, and what I've done is uh, I've looked through both of these to see if I could find significant differences. And what I decided to do is look at the UBS 5's uh, A readings. These are the readings that they indica indicate with a letter A that they believe that the text is certain. And I've seen if the Tyndall House disagrees with them. If the bunch of guys sitting around the table at Cambridge uh, differs from the bunch of guys sitting around the table wherever the, the uh, UBS 5 was developed. Uh, whether they come to the same conclusion. Um, UBS 5 contains uh, 500 of these A readings. I, I know because I went through and I counted them. Now, I might be off by one or two, but uh, I counted every one. Um, and uh, there are about 500, and I found nine places where the Tyndall House disagrees with the UBS 5. So we'll be looking at 
those in the next few minutes. And the first one I want to show you is in Matthew in chapter 18 and verse 26. And the difference here is this word Kyrie, which is present in Tyndall House, but absent in the UBS 5 in an A reading. And I put in the, this slide, um, I put in a, a blue background box um, what uh, Bruce Metzger says about it and uh, what the NET Bible says about that. That's the New English translation, which I should be reviewing here within a, a month or two. Um, I'm not going to talk about those as we go through these slides. I just wanted uh, them to be there for you to read if you wanted. And um, it's not really quite fair to Tyndall House to only prepare, present the uh, opposing view. Uh, but I don't have the Tyndall House view yet because I don't have their textual commentary. And I, I really, in, on, in preparing this video, just found out about their blog. So I haven't had time to search their blog in detail. So Kyrie is the first one in Matthew 18.26. The second one is uh, here in Mark uh, 9.29 where uh, UBS leaves out uh, and fasting at the end of the verse. I don't mean to, by showing the Greek here to indicate that I'm a Greek expert. I'm not. I'm rather like a third grader trying to read the Encyclopedia Britannica. But uh, I can make out the differences here. And um, you can read Metzger and NET below on this chart and uh, see their reasons for leaving out and fasting. And perhaps sometime soon we'll find out why Tyndall House decided to put it in. Right, the uh, third one of the nine is here. Luke 22, 43 through 44. All of that text. I should point out that in the apparatus below, um, Tyndall House does say that the omission is uh, a possibility that emitting those verses is something that could be done. They're not certain about their reading. That's what their diamond indicates down below. So this is the section in Luke 22 where the angel from heaven appear, appears to Jesus while he's on the cross and he's in agony and his sweat drops, uh, falls like drops of blood to the ground. So what's next? The next one is uh, just another couple of pages over in Luke 23, 34. And it's uh, this material here at the beginning of verse 34. Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, uh, for they don't, do not know what they do. And then UBS 5 picks up with this part, and they cast lots, dividing up. It's dividing up here. Um, lots is here at the end. They cast up, uh, cast lots, and divided up his garments among them. Again, you can read what Metzger says there, and I just excised a short bullet from the NET Bible note there. So we'll go along. Here's John. Next is uh, Gospel of John, seven thirty-nine, and it's only one word. The word um, holy after spirit. And um, again, in a diamond reading in the footnote, uh, T, uh, the Tyndall House says that uh, omitting it is a possibility, but they decided to leave it in, whereas UBS 5 omitted it. From there, we'll go to Romans 5.1. I have to go far back, I think, because Romans is in the Pauline stuff, and in this New Testament, it's fairly far back. So, um, therefore, having been justified by faith, or uh, therefore, since uh, having been justified by faith, uh, let us have peace, or we have peace. The, uh, the difference here is in one Greek letter, in that word. Um, they chose the Omega in Tyndall House. They chose the Omicron in UBS 5. I believe Westcott and Hort may have had the Omega because the American Standard Version, or maybe the Revised Version, has let us there. Um, so this is something that's been bouncing back and forth in English translations. 
but they say let us here in Tyndall House, where UBS 5 says we have. Let us have versus we have. Okay, 2 Corinthians uh, 1, 6 and 7. Well, this is uh, a little hard to show in the Greek, so we'll just zip correctly, quickly to the chart, and you can see where material has been moved. It's largely a reorganization, and this will be very interesting to read about when the uh, commentary comes out. Why did they choose that reading, since Metzger is so certain that he can explain the origin of the other texts from his choice? Um, Next, we're in Hebrews, and it's the end of the, bo the book, um, where it says, uh, Grace with you all, uh, and then Tyndall House adds, Amen, at the end. And UBS 5 is absolutely certain that Amen is not part of the original text. So one bog set says yes, Amen, one bog set says no, no Amen. They both have their reasons. Finally, ninth and last, is Revelation 5 9. Again, this comes down to one word. I guess that's more significant than one letter. But, um, where they are, art thou to take the book and to break its seals, for thou wast slain and didst purchase for our God? That's the way Tyndall House reads. Um, UBS 5 just says God and leaves out our. Um, I've only had the, the Greek New Testament for a um, period of time, just a couple of months, and I haven't been able to look through it in detail, look at all the readings and compare it with UBS or the for its different uh, readings. Um, but uh, I have been reading it from time to time and glancing through it, and I've come up with this collection. You should be seeing another chart. Um, B readings, uh, curly bracket B, those are almost certain according to UBS 5, and curly bracket C, those are the ones that they're not sure about. So they go from metaphysical certainty to almost certain, and then down to, well, maybe, maybe not, at C. So here are some other um, differences that you, you, could, you could look through. Um, but the one that's most interesting to me is that Tyndall House has chosen in John 1.18, only begotten Son, which is the old reading from the Textus Receptus that the King James carries, rather than only begotten God, which uh, which is in uh, the UBS 5 and in most modern translations. Incidentally, I got interested in this uh, some time ago and started looking through uh, the works of Athanasius, the great uh, North African um, champion of the Trinity the deity of Christ back in the fourth century, and I found that he generally quotes only begotten son, even though he's Egyptian, and one would think that he would have the Egyptian text before him. But his quotations say only begotten son. He is fighting against the Arians who say that, yes, Jesus was a son in some sense, but he was not uh, in nature the same as God. Uh, finally, I'm going to attempt to do some comparisons. I have the uh, Tyndall House Greek New Testament up on a stand. I just want to show you the font compared with the uh, the font of the TBS and the UBS 5. So we'll show the TBS first. Um, remember that the book on the right is a little closer to the camera, so the font will look a little larger than it actually is in real life. It is a bit larger, it appears. To my naked eyes on the right. It, of course, is much bolder on the right, and the paper, I believe, has a little bit less show through. Not much less, but a little less um, in the TBS than in the Tyndall House. But the advantage to the Tyndall House, the Tyndall House is perfectly readable, and it has crisper characters, so it's easier to make out the, uh, the breathing marks and the accents and the iota subscripts, things like that which can be very helpful if you're a bit confused about what you're looking at. Um, <clears throat> there's the uh, UBS 5 at roughly the same spot. 17 and 17 have a lot more apparatus than the UBS 5, so it's very hard to show anything other than verse 17 there next to each other. 
Again, the font on the right looks larger. I prefer the font on the left, however. I think it's more attractive. Um, and it is darker and bolder. And the paper on the right is thinner. So I think if you're just looking for an Egyptian type uh, manuscript, not manuscript, an Egyptian, an Egyptian edition based on uh, early Alexandrian manuscripts uh, to read, then you might want to go with the Tyndall House. But if you're interested in uh, understanding more about uh, the different um, um, the, the different texts that attest to the different readings, then you'll want to go with the UBS five um, or with the uh, Nestle Elan twenty eight, which uh, goes into even more detail about variant readings, although it shows fewer sources for each reading. Um, one thing that you miss out with on the for, because of the simple formatting that they've chosen in the Tyndall House is things like this, where the uh, UBS 5 shows quotations from the Old Testament in a bold character so that it's very obvious that's what's going on there. Um, I think it's a very good book. I think they've uh, produced one that's uh, very good. I like the paper. I like the print. Um, if you're in the market for a an Alexandrian type Greek New Testament, uh, this may be the thing to get if you're interested in just reading it and you're not that concerned about whether your ESV your, or your NASB tracks that closely to it. By the way, the NASB has sort of a mind of its own and goes where it likes from time to time, regardless of what the underlying um, UBS says. They like to choose variant readings sometimes. Um, if you're interested in what translators are interested in reading, then the UBS 5 is probably the way to go on the Egyptian Alexandrian side. If you're interested in more details about the various, um, you'd like to see a larger number of variant readings, then go with uh, the Nestle Elan 27. If you, uh, if you uh, want to read it beside your um, King James Version, regardless of whether you think the Textus Receptus is inspired by God in the original or not, um, but if you're interested in practicing your Greek uh, using your King James New Testament, then I recommend the TBS, because that works very well. Another Greek New Testament that I plan to uh, review at some time is this uh, Anchor House uh, Byzantine text form. This is the Greek New Testament uh, that uh, includes the Robinson Pierpont text. Maurice Robinson and William G. Pierpont. And it's very nicely done. Perhaps not quite as well done as the Tyndall House, but still a good product and not that expensive. So uh, with that, we will wrap this video up. And thanks again for watching.